All right, word is bond. Let's get started. All right, real quick. So, any questions about the uh, project that's due today in uh, 12 hours? None, because everyone's off going doing it. Okay. Um, so, also, real quick reminder today. At 4.30, we have uh, a, a friend from Battery Ventures giving a talk in Gates. And then tomorrow at noon is the one of the time series lectures. We have somebody from KDB coming giving a talk. All right, so uh, just we're now sort of entering a new chapter in the semester where now we're going to start talking about concurrency control and allowing multiple queries or transactions, and I'll define what a transaction is in a second, to run at the same time and modify the database at the same time. So hopefully uh, you can get the impression of how excited I am, because this is my favorite lecture, because this is the, this is what, this is what in my opinion, this is one of the most fascinating things that database systems can do, of uh, sort of this magic of allowing things to run at the same time inside of our system, and it sort of have the, almost the illusion of, uh, uh, that they that they're they're running uh, on, a, on a database by themselves. So to sort of motivate uh, what we're talking about today, and actually for a lot of the stuff of the rest of the semester, I want to propose two sort of sort of simple scenarios, right? So the first one is that uh, you and I are, are going to execute a query at the same time on the same database, exact same moment, um, and we want to access the same record. We want to modify it at the same at the same time. So the, so the question is, like, what, what should actually happen here, right? How do we avoid, uh, you know, one, one write in, incorrectly overriding another write, or maybe seeing a half of a, you know, if I up, update 10 tuples, or sorry, 10 attributes, and you update to the same 10 attributes, we don't want to see, you know, my five and your five, right? We want to avoid all this, all these problems. Another scenario would be if you have, say, uh, a bank account, and you want to transfer money from one account to the another, uh, Let's say that you start the transfer and you take the money out of the first account, and then all of a sudden there's a power failure, uh, and you don't actually complete the process of putting in the money in the other account. So when we turn the system back on and we recover, what should what should be the correct state of the database? Right? What, we want we don't want to lose money, obviously, because that'd be really bad. So these two problems are roughly called the you know loss update problem and the durability problem, and. The, the solution we're going to have inside of our database management system to solve uh, both of these uh, are either the concurrency control protocol, which is what we'll talk about today, or the recovery protocol, which we'll talk about in a, in a couple weeks. Um, but the, the, the thing I want to impress upon you is that these things are not completely separate, and they're actually closely intertwined. And this is sort of, again, go back to the question somebody asked earlier in the semester, or why can't I just use RocksDB to maintain my log and do whatever else I want in, in the system? Uh, and this is because there's, the concurrent control needs to know what the recovery system is doing, and the recovery system needs to know what the concurrent control is doing, in order to make sure that if you have both of these scenarios, uh, that we don't, we don't lose data, we don't end up with incorrect data, and, and everything sort of goes along correctly. So the concurrent control and recovery mechanisms are, are one of the two key valuable, two key uh, contributions that you get from using a database management system to manage your data versus just writing your own you know, files out the disk and hoping that every, everything goes OK. Um, and the key concept that's going to sort of uh, encompass all of this, or sort of the, 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 the the key principle that we're going to have to be able to understand and reason about whether our database system is, is running correctly is this notion of a transaction. And this is a term that's often used in computer science to mean different things, the bank transaction, uh, you know, adding things to the shopping cart and things like that. But in the context that we're going to talk about, it has a very specific, specific definition uh, that we need to understand in order to understand how we're going to build our concurrent control protocol or mechanism and our, our recovery subsystem. So in the context of a, of, a, a, of a database management system, and I'll say this doesn't have to be a relational database system to have these types of transactions. You could have a NoSQL or a document database system. The transaction essentially be the same. But for our purposes, you know, we're focusing on relational databases, so we'll use that as our, as our running example. But it, our definition of a transaction is that it's going to be this sequence of operations that we're going to execute inside of our database system on behalf of the application to perform some higher level function. 
So by higher level function, I mean think of like the things that your application could do, right? Using Amazon as an example, right? You can add something to your cart, you can make a purchase, you can update your account information. All those three, those things are considered the high level function. And the way the application is going to uh, invoke them or actually have them perform that function in our database is through this concept of, of a transaction. Now, I will say also, you know, in, in some systems, like Amazon, for example, adding something to the shopping, shopping cart is not a transaction, but for our purposes, we'll, we'll just assume that it is. And so the, the, the basic unit of change that the database management system is going to deal with, all right, that, that it's going to expose to you as the application programmer is this concept of a transaction. And a transaction, as we'll also see in a second, uh, is defined by the operations that the application wants to perform in that transaction, and it's the only thing that the, that the database system will save. Right? You have to have all the operations in your transaction. You can't have some of them or half of them. Right? Now, you can have a transaction that has one query, right? then that's, that's sort of trivial. Uh, but if I have multiple queries, then I can't have some of them work and some of them not work. Everything has to be able to be, get saved and, and run correctly in order for my, for my system to go from a, a correct state to, to another correct state. So let's go to this running example that I showed in the beginning. Say that I have a gambling problem and I want to take $100 out of my bank account and transfer it to my bookies, bookies account. So the high level function of our transaction is, is what I've written in English there. Uh, but the steps that we're going to have in our transaction are the following. For, you know, first you have to take the $100 out of my account. Uh, then you got to, uh, well, sorry, you have to check to see why I have $100. And then if I do, then you go ahead and take the $100 out. Then you put it into the bookies account. And this sort of goes back to what I was saying in the last slide about the, the transaction was always going to be the, the, the atomic unit of changes in our database. because. For either of these three steps in my transaction, I don't want you know, some of them to succeed and not, all, you know, and not others. Right? I don't want to take money out of my, my account and then not put into the bookies account because if I crash, then that $100 just sort of disappears into the ether. And that's bad because now the bank's losing money, customers complain, and try to figure out what's going on. So we're going to talk about how we're actually going to be able to support this in our database system over the, the, the next couple of lectures. Right? In this sort of simple case, it's, I'm, I'm only talking about one transaction running at a time. Uh, but now when things get really tricky, if now you have, may have multiple transactions running simultaneously. But in this case here, assume we have one transaction at a time, let's sort of propose a straw man system that could actually s solve this problem. Right? It'll make sure that everything's atomic, and we'll make sure that all our changes are saved. So what we're going to do is we're going to have a database management system where transaction requests will, will arrive one at a time. And there'll be a single thread in our system. It'll take the queue of the transactions as they arrive in the system, executes them from beginning to end, uh, it makes all the changes they want to make, and then go ahead and, and, and completes the transaction and saves it. And what they're going to do is that, that thread is every single time you're going to start a new transaction, uh, you're going to have some database file. And you're just going to make a complete copy of it, put it into another location on disk and then have your transaction make all its changes to that copied file. Um, and then if the transaction uh, commits successfully, or say, completes successfully, then you just overwrite the, the original file with the, with the modified version. Right? And then if the transaction fails or we lose power, or it's not a big deal because when we come back, we'd see we have the original file that was unmodified, and we have our modified file that has some of the changes of our transaction, but not all of them. So we just throw away that modified one, and we go back to our original file, and now we know that we don't have any partial transactions. So why, why not this would be a good idea? Yes? It's guaranteed atomic because you do a pointer swing at the end. So his, his statement is that it's guaranteed to be atomic because you do a pointer swing at the end. To point the, yeah, there's a master point that says, where's my correct version of the database? It's either the, the original one or the, the new one after the transaction saved. Yes? But suppose you're Amazon. What's that? Suppose you're Amazon, meaning what? You can't copy the right. It's, it's, it's actually uh, it'd be very. If you're, this is trivial to do if your database is like you know four kilobytes. But if it's anything larger than that, then you're copying a, a huge you know file every single time. So this seems kind of like uh, simplistic, um, but this is actually used in a very very uh, well known database system. Can anybody guess which system uses this? 
Nobody. He says my SQL because they're different. No, not SQL. SQLite actually does this. Uh, now, this is actually the older version of SQLite. In the last couple of years, they switched over to a write-ahead log. Um, but there is actually still the ability to use this, this particular uh, version, or this type of, uh, of system in SQLite now. Right? And again, this works, this works really well right, for embedded, embedded systems or small, small applications, small databases. Database is not going to be real big. I copy it, make all my changes, and go ahead and commit. And even though I, I, you know, I'm running at a single thread, that's fine because I'm not trying to support thousands and thousands of concurrent users trying to access my database, right? SQLite is running inside of your, your, your cell phone and things like that. Um, I will say also, too, we'll talk about maybe later in the semester, this is sort of what actually IBM did in the very first version of, of System R, right? They actually used a technique called shadow paging, which is sort of like this, but instead of copying the whole file, you just copy the pages you actually need to modify. And then you flip a pointer at the end to say, here's, here's the correct version. So in this one, this, this, is, this is pretty simplistic, but it actually it'll serve our purpose. Um, but what we're going to talk about uh, in the next couple classes is, is how to allow multiple transactions to run at the same time and read and write to the database at the same time without may having to make an entire copy of the database file for, uh, for every single time. And it's sort of obvious when we talk, you know, why you'd want to do this, because we already sort of covered this when we talked about parallel execution. Right? We said that we're going to get better utilization and throughput because now threads aren't going to get you know, blocked with each other, waiting in a single queue for, to execute on a single thread. Um, and this is going to re reduce the response time for, uh, for, our, for our users. Right? The time it takes when they submit a transaction from the time it takes it finishes and, and you get the acknowledgement back from the database system uh, will be much less in, in this environment. But there's a whole bunch of other stuff we have to deal with uh, that is actually very, very hard and in order to make this, this parallel execution stuff work. So when we talked about parallel execution before, I was completely hand wavy or I completely ignored the issue of, of queries or transactions updating the same record at the same time. Right? We only really talked about read-only queries, just scanning large segments of the table. So who cares if, if they interfere with each other because you know, they're, they're both reading and, that's, and that, that doesn't cause a problem. But now, if we want to have transactions modifying things, we have to care about correctness because it, you know, it's not good if we start losing money or losing records or, or corrupting data. Um, but then there's another issue also, too, of, of fairness, which we'll talk a little bit when we talk about two-phase locking and other concurrent show protocols. But ideally, you want you know, transactions to, you know, that get submitted to the system, they all have sort of a fair chance to actually be able to run. Right? You don't want you know, one, one client's transaction to always finish and everything else to always get killed and blocked. So what I'll say, though, that this is act both of these things are actually very, very hard. Uh, and it's hard to ensure correctness because, again, if you have threads or transactions trying to access the same records and modify at the same time, then how do we make sure that they don't interfere with each other? Um, and it's also executed very quickly. Because if you take like a really simplistic view of like having a single thread execute every transaction one after another uh, for your entire database, then that's going to be be slow. Now again, I will say there's some database systems, in particular like VoltDB, is the system I helped create uh, at least the earlier version of it when I was in grad school. They actually run with single threads, but they run single threads on on multiple cores, so it's not like a single thread for the entire entire machine. Um, and this allows you to do some of the things, you, like avoid some of the problems that we'll talk about as we go along. But in general, doing this for a, a general purpose workload uh, or, or for any application, doing both of these things is, 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 is hard. And this is part of the reason why the NoSQL system guys uh, became in vogue a few years ago, because they got much better performance than the traditional transactional databases systems, because they didn't do any of the things that we're talking about here today. Because in their environment, for their applications that they were targeting, uh, they decided that was, that was not necessary. Right? Like, again, using the shopping cart example, like if I add something to my shopping cart, um, it doesn't maybe really, maybe it doesn't matter if it's a few, you know, few milliseconds delayed from, a, from showing up on another machine, right? Or some other things like that, right? Or if you ha have two, two people buy the same thing at the same time, Rather than making sure that everything's, you know, you only sell the items that you have, and they might just do things like, all right, well, I, 
I'll let, uh, if, if, if two people try to buy the same item and I run out of it, I'll just issue a coupon to the one person that didn't get it, and that's better than having to maintain transactions and, and, and spend more money on hardware. Um, again, we'll, we'll cover that as we go along. So his statement is that uh, at some point in Black Friday, they sent you underwear and socks, or what did they send you? Socks. They sent you a box full of underwear because of a transaction failure. Uh, that might not be the database. That might be other things. But we can talk about that more about that when we talk about dist distributed systems. OK. All right. So again, I just want to impress upon you that doing transactions very fast and doing transactions correctly is very hard. But that's why they pay database developers a lot of money to do, the, do these things. So with that in mind, let's keep going. OK, so the, the issues that we're going to have to deal with when we have transactions trying to modify the database at the same time are, are the following. So we know that we want to allow transactions that show up at the same time. We want to issue a bunch of different queries. We want to interleave their operations in a way that's going to allow us to maximize the parallelism in our system. But the issue is going to be is that if we interleave transactions in, in sort of incorrect ways, then we can end up with inconsistent data, meaning there may be data that appears that shouldn't actually be there, or there may be uh, you know, negative values that shouldn't be there, right? things like that. So in this environment, as we go along, there'll be cases where there'll be temporary inconsistencies, where the database is in an in invalid state while transactions are running. But that's OK, and, and it's unavoidable. Uh, just as long as that when the transaction commits, uh, we don't, you know, that th these things get resolved. What we don't want to have is like these permanent inconsistencies where, you know, we issue, uh, you know, we, we allow you to, to reserve a, a, a seat on a plane that's not actually there or buy something that's not actually there. So to understand these inconsistencies, understand these issues, we need to have a sort of a formal definition of what it means for a database system or database to be correct when you execute transactions on them. And this is going to look a lot different than uh, if you've taken like, any sort of parallel programming course and we talk about concurrency or linearizability. This is going to look a lot, a, lot, a, lot, a lot different. OK, so in our environment, what's going to happen is that we're going to, transactions are going to carry out one or more operations on data that they've retrieved from the database. But the database management system is, is only in charge of scheduling operations in these transactions that can read and write data inside the database. So that's the only sort of purview of control that it has on your reads and writes in the database. So that means, like, say you have a transaction that does a bunch of reads, then does a bunch of writes, and then in the middle of that transaction, it decides to send a confirmation email to the customer to say, yes, your, your, your order succeeded. But then that transaction fails and you need to roll back all the writes. That email that it sent out is outside the control of the database system. It's like considered the external world. So it can't retract that email. Right? So, so it's very important to understand that when we say a transaction, the scope of what we're dealing with is only inside the database. Anything that goes outside the database system, which you could do when we talked about UDFs, right? talked about that you, know, you could have your, your UDF written in C, and then you could call whatever outside system you want to do whatever you want. The database system can't control and roll back those things, right? it can't make sure those changes outside of itself are, are, are fail safe. So we're only talking about things that are inside internally in the database system. And so for as we go along in our examples, uh, we're going to say our database is going to be defined as a fixed set of named objects. They can be tuples, they can be rows, or sorry, they can be tuples, they can be pages, they can be uh, individual attributes, they can be entire, entire databases. For all the protocols we'll talk about, we're not going to care. And the other thing I'll talk about too is that we're saying that this is all, for now, we're just assuming that it's, it's fixed. Meaning when you start the system and you start running your transactions, you have the same number of elements as before as you do after. We'll relax this in, 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 in two lectures when we talk, talk about other things, because this makes it harder. For now, we'll just assume we have fixed number of uh, elements. And then our transactions are going to be only defined on, uh, or defined using the, the read and write operations. So we don't care about whether it's, it's, an, it's an update, uh, if you update some attributes or all the attributes. Right? We, just, we just know we're writing th this object. So this is the only thing that the data system actually can see 
uh, in terms of the transaction on what the application is actually trying to do. It doesn't know that you read this object and then, and then you know, did some funky math on a, or you, you know, ran it through some Python package. All that is ex external and it can't control that. So in SQL, uh, the, the way we're going to start a transaction is through the begin statement. And then a transaction will finish or terminate either with a commit or abort statement. Or sometimes also, I think SQL standard says rollback is, is an alias for abort. So when a transaction commits, all the changes that it made with those write operations that I defined in the last slide, all those things will now be saved into the database. And we'll say that, those sa that, that you know, when it's saved, it's actually permanent. It's forever persistent or durable. And then you, as the application programmer, you do not get an acknowledgment from the database system that your transaction is successfully committed until all the changes have been uh, applied to the database and are, are now persistent. If there's an abort command, uh, all the changes that you make will get rolled back, and it'll be as if the transaction never, never ran at all. And so now one of the key things to understand about this is that an abort can ha either be self-inflicted or, or uh, forced upon you by the database system. So what I mean by that is if I start a transaction in, in my terminal and I, I make a bunch of changes and then I call a rollback or abort, right, that's self-inflicted. That's me telling the database server, rollback my, my transaction. But it may be the case also, too, that the database system, uh, that the application tried to commit says, I, I made all my changes and now I want to commit. And the database system says, oh, no, I can't, I can't let you do that. Right? Because it's going to interfere with some other transaction. And it'll, it'll violate the guarantees I, I need to ensure. So you can't commit. I'm going to kill you. And you have to roll back. Right? And you'll see this in the third project when you implement two-phase locking. Right? When a transaction tries to acquire a lock and it can't because somebody else holds it, uh, you, the, the database system can say, no, no, you, you, can't com you can't keep going, kill yourself, and roll back. Right? So again, this will come up later on when we talk about the different concurrent protocols. But an abort can be either because the transaction, the, the application wants to abort, or the data system forces them to abort. So now the correctness criteria we're going to have is defined by this acronym ACID. I say, quick show of hands, who here has heard of ACID before? Okay, so most of you. Okay, good. So ACID was defined by, uh, came up with in the late, sorry, early 1980s by a researcher in Germany. Um, and it stands for atomicity, consistency, isolation, and durability. And so if you say you're, you're a transactional database system or ACID-based database system, you want to ensure that your transactions have all these three properties. Um, and as far as I can tell, the lore goes, the way the lore was, goes for this, this acronym, the guy that came up with this was trying to make fun of his wife because his wife didn't like uh, sweet uh, like candy. She only liked sour things. So he came up with the term acid to sort of to name it after her. But in order to make it work, he kind of had to force consistency in there to get, to get a C. And as we see when we talk about it in, in, a, in a next couple of slides, consistency is this really nebulous thing. It doesn't have a, an exact definition like the other ones do. Um, but you know, people always include it, and we'll, we'll, we'll talk about it as it comes along. All right, so for atomicity, it means that all transactions, all actions or operations the transaction will happen or none of them will happen. And this goes back to the no partial, partial transactions uh, requirement we had before. Consistency means that if every transaction is consistent, which I'll define uh, in a bit, and the database starts out being consistent, then if I execute the transaction and it commits, then the end result of the database has to be consistent. So if I go from, from a consistent database with a consistent transaction, I should end up with a consistent database. And again, I'll explain what consistent means uh, in a bit. And then the isolation is the one we'll spend most of our time talking about today. Uh, but this means that if the transaction will execute inside of our database system under the illusion that it has exclusive access to, to the database. So that means if other transactions are running at the same time, the, the, my transaction can't see any of their changes. I only see the, 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 I only see the data as if, it was, if I, if I, as if I was the only one running. And durability is sort of obvious. It basically means that if a transaction commits and we get back the acknowledgment from our, to our application that a transaction is successfully committed, then all the changes, the modifications we made in our transaction will always be per persist forever. And any transaction that comes along later should be able to see our changes. And no matter how times we restart and crash, all our changes are, are durable. So a shorthand way to think about all of these is that 
Atomicity means basically all or nothing for operations in our transaction. Consistency means, you know, hand wavy. Eh, it looks correct to me. That's good enough. Uh, isolation means if the transaction is running as if it was alone by itself. And the durability means that we can survive failures. So for today's agenda, we're going to go through each of these one by one. Um, and we'll spend most of our time talking about isolation because this is, this is where you actually understand the this, you know, transaction schedules and things like that. Um, for durability, we'll talk more about logging uh, later in, in a few weeks. And then uh, on, so m most of the time we spend atomicity and isolation. And then when we start talking about concurrency control protocols like uh, two phase locking, timestamp ordering, all the index stuff, uh, that will be mo mostly focusing on the atomicity and isolation. Okay? Okay, so as I said earlier, uh, there's basically two possible outcomes when you execute a transaction. Right? And it's either that the transaction commits after all its changes have been applied to the database, right? everything was successful, or the transaction aborts, either because the application said to abort, or the database system says you have to abort. Um, and then after, after executing some, some, number of transact, some number of actions or operations, and then the database system is going to ensure that all the changes that a transaction, a successfully committed transaction makes are atomic, meaning they're all sort of appear inside the database all at once. And so the, again, from an from a application programmer standpoint, this means basically that all the operations we do in a transaction will always finish if our transaction commits, or none of them will finish. We don't see any, any par partial modifications. So the way we're going to ensure this uh, is, is, is through possibly two approaches. And we'll go back to that example that we had before, where I was taking money out of my, my account and putting it into my bookies account. But let's say that before, again, we put into the bookies account, there's a power failure, and we crash, and we need to come back, and we need to make sure that everything's always in the correct state. So the two ways to do this are uh, through logging. Um, the way, basically, think about this is that every single time we make, a, we make a modification to the database, we're going to write into a log file and say, here's the change that I made to this particular tuple. And the contents of, that of what that we write in the log can vary based on the implementation. Um, it could just be the SQL statement. It could be the actual low-level bytes of, of the things that was modified. But sort of, it's a record of all the changes that we made. We want to apply those changes to the log before we apply them to our database. Right? So that way, if we crash, we come back and we look in our log, and we say, well, what was going on at the time of the crash? and check to see whether in our, 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 our actual heap files in our table, whether those changes actually should be, should be there or not. So you can look in the log and you see, well, here's a transaction that was running, and then, there, then the log stops because there's a crash, and you didn't see a commit message for any of those transactions, so you know you need to go back and roll back their changes right, so, that, so that none of them are there. Or if you do see a commit message, then you know the transaction is successfully committed, so now you need to go back into your... To the, to the table heap itself and check this to make sure that those changes are persisted. So again, you think of this sort of like a black box in the airplane, right? It's a, it's a bit of morbid metaphor, but like the plane crashes, everyone dies, but you want to know what was going on inside the plane at the moment that caused it to crash. So you get the black box, you, you look in the log and say, you know, it went down, right? And, and why? So lo logging is the most commonly used technique to ensure atomicity. Um, and it's not just in database systems, it's used in a, in a ton of different systems. Like file systems do stuff like this. Um, and it has two benefits, right? One is that uh, we can turn what would normally be random writes to, to, to disk pages into sequential writes to a single log, which is much faster if you're using a spinning disk hard drive. Um, and it's also used as an audit trail for uh, compliancy or regulatory purposes. Right? If you want to know, you know who transferred money to who in, in your bank account, you can look at the database log and, and, and look at all those operations. Right? It's very common, I think, in, in some uh, enterprises, like the Sarbanes-Oxley Oxley requires you to have seven years of audit trail history for your, for your business if you're doing financial transactions. Um, and so you can use the right-hand log, the, the log in the database system to do this for you. The other approach is actually what I alluded to before when we talked about the, the, one of the, the ways you can run SQLite, um, this idea of, called shadow paging. And the idea is, again, basically, if the transaction wants to make a change to a tuple, that tuple is going to be in a page. So you copy that page first, 
then make all your changes to that page, and then when the transaction commits, you just flip a pointer to say, here's the correct version of this page. And this ensures that, um, that you know, when you crash, come back, if the transaction didn't finish, then you know you shouldn't be, you know, you don't even bother with the modified pages, you only have to look at the original pages. Or if the transaction did finish, then it's sort of a uh, tautology because if the transaction committed, then the original pages are the correct pages, right? So again, this was originally used by IBM in the, in the 1970s. They eventually abandoned this because it has a bunch of implementation issues that are really tricky to get right. Uh, and there was other aspects of the system that uh, were difficult to use with this. Um, so they, they, they eventually didn't do this. Or they eventually got rid of it and DB2 doesn't do this at all. Um, nowadays, as far as I know, the only two systems that actually do this approach is the LMDB system from, from the Open LDAP guys, uh, and then CouchDB does this as well. Um, again, it has, it's, it's an interesting idea. Uh, we actually tried this to do this in non-volatile memory, thinking an old idea could be used with new hardware, and didn't actually turn out. Using the, the write-ahead log and the in-place updates was always faster. Uh, but for, for LMDB, it's trying to solve a different problem than sort of a general purpose database. All right, so that's everything about atomicity, right? Again, it's either all the changes occur in a transaction or none of them change. And the way the data system is going to enforce this is either through logging or through shadow paging. But actually, now you can kind of see where the, how these things are sort of intertwined because the logging, shadow paging is also how you can ensure durability, but this is how we're also going to ensure atomicity. Yes? This question is, if I use logging, if there's a crash, what do I do? So what you do is you, you come back and you immediately go to the log. And you say, well, what, what transactions were running at the time that I crashed, right? You actually do multiple passes. We'll, we'll cover that later. But basically, you look at the log, say, what transactions were running at the time I crashed? And did they commit? If they didn't commit, then you want to go into the, da the database pages and make sure that their changes were, are not actually there, right? Because what could happen is you could make a change to a, a page in memory, and the buffer manager flushes that out, but the transaction hasn't committed yet, and you, but it, it made it to the log. So you want to go back and make sure that you reverse that change. Or if, 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 uh, if it was in the buffer pool and didn't get flushed to disk yet, then you want to make sure that, that you go actually make those changes if the transaction did commit. So the log, as we'll see later, will actually make sure you do undo and redo. Anything that committed, Always, always it makes it to the disk. Anything that didn't commit it always gets reversed. So my question is, well, what if crash happens again? Right, so, so excellent. So then his question is, well, what if I'm recovering from the log and I crash again? Right, so the, uh, we'll have a whole lecture on how to do log recovery with ARIES, A-R-I-E-S, which is from, from IBM guys in the 1990s. They have a whole mechanism to deal with crashing during recovery. Now, you basically put these compensating log records to say, I recovered and I made this change, and you write that to the log as well. So when you crash, you come back and you figure out, well, did I crash from, from a recovery or did I crash from, from actually runtime? So this whole, this, you're learning to hate this. Okay. <laughs> yes. The same question. Yeah. So in shadow paging, you don't, have to, you don't have to do this because you just come back and immediately the database is correct, right? Because the pointer only points to things that actually got committed. In logging, it's a bit more tricky. But in general, this is, this is, uh, this, this gives you better performance. Okay. So now we need to talk about consistency. So again, this is very nebulous. Uh, I think it's easier to understand in the context of a distributed database. Uh, but for now, we're only focused on a single, single node database. And we'll so go to, sort of go by the textbook definition of this. So the way to sort of think about consistency is that the, the world represented by the, by the data in your database is correct. And I'm not going to define what correct means, because it depends on the application. It depends on sort of humans understanding or having an, a notion of what correctness is. So the two sort of sub-elements of consistency are database consistency and transaction consistency. So database consistency is something that the, the database system can actually enforce. And again, basically means that the, the database managed by the database system accurately represents whatever the real-world entity that they're trying to model. 
so think of it like this. Like, so if my, my database is capturing temperatures of, 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 you know, of buildings on campus, uh, I could have a constraint that says you know, no temperature could be greater than a million, right? because otherwise every, everything would be on fire. So the database system will, infor, will in, ensure and enforce that nobody inserts data that violates that constraint. Right? So that's what it means, means to be correct. And the reason why I'm being handy about this is because if you don't write a constraint that says uh, you know, no temperature can be above a million, then the data system can't know that that can't happen. So it can't enforce that. Right? Another way to think about this also too, and this will come up more when we talk about distributed databases, is that any transactions that happen in the future will always be able to see the effects of transactions that committed in the past within our, within our database. Right? And this sort of seems obvious when you're on a single node because transaction you know, commits, everything you know, made it out to disk, I know it's all adorable, and then I come back and of course everything's going to be there. The in distributed databases, it's, it's, it's much different. So, right, so database, the database consistency basically means any data we put in will actually model the world or entity outside of it that, that it's trying to model. But it's only as good as use the application programmer can tell the database system what to model. Transaction consistency is even more vague, and it basically means that if the database starts out in a consistent state before your transaction runs, uh, and you assume your transaction is running by itself, then the database will be consistent after the transaction completes. And of course, now this again relies on you as the application programmer to make sure you write correct transactions because otherwise, if, if, if you don't do that and you put the database in an inconsistent state, the database doesn't know that because it just did whatever you told it to do. So again, using that, that the example with the temperature, if I insert something that's a million degrees my trans and I do that in my transaction, the database system doesn't know that it shouldn't have done that and that's not accurately model modeling the real world, uh, but the transaction you know, told it to do it, so it just went, it went ahead and did it. So there's no way the database management system can enforce this at all because it's up to you as the application programmer to write transactions that do the correct thing. Right, so this is sort of what I was saying before that the, they throw the C in there in ACID to have a nice acronym, but in practice it's the, the C part is, is kind of weird. And that's pretty much all I have to say about this, right? It looks correct to you, it looks correct to me, it's consistent. That's it. Okay. So now we get to a good one, isolation. So isolation, again, means that if a transaction executes in our database system, then we want it to have the illusion that it's running with exclusive access to the database and nobody else is running at the same time. And that basically means that it doesn't see the effects of made by transactions that, that, have, that haven't completed yet or committed yet. Uh, and actually, that, that's actually incorrect, too. Right? It doesn't, it, it's running as if all the transactions were running in serial order, one after another. And it doesn't see any, uh, I won't say inconsistent, but it doesn't see any sort of halfway chaff changes or partial changes or things that may be committed after it actually already started. Right? Only things see things as if transactions were running in serial order. So the, the, the problem we're going to have with, though, as I said earlier, is that we don't want to execute, execute, actually execute transactions in serial order because we want to maximize the performance of our system and maximize parallelism. So we want to allow these, in these interleaving operations in our transactions because it may be the case that one transaction has to access data on disk and therefore has to stall while the buffer pool manager goes and fetches, it, fetches the page, brings it into memory, and while it's stalled, we may want to allow other transactions to keep on running and still make forward progress. Right? But we want to make sure that, again, even though they're running in parallel and we're interleaving the operations in arbitrary ways, we want to make sure that it still looks as if they're running in isolation with each other. So the way we're going to achieve this is through the database management system's concurrent control protocol. All right, so the, the concurrent control protocol, the definition I like to use is essentially like the traffic cop in the database system that's going to decide what operations are allowed to execute and how to interleave them. And then the end, the end result of, this, of the database of this interleaving, the end state should be equivalent or the same as if the transactions were executed in serial order, even though they, they didn't. Now, there's two classes of protocols we're going to want to follow. Uh, or there's, it's essentially, there's two classes of, of, of categories of, of computer protocols we can have in our system. 
right? The first one's pessimistic, and the second one's optimistic. So pessimistic is where you assume that transactions are going to conflict, and therefore you, uh, you, do, you, you apply protections to make sure that transactions can't do the things that would cause problems. Right? You sort of prevent them ahead of time. And optimistic is where you see that conflicts are going to be rare, or there's, going to be, there's, there's less likely that transactions are going to be, uh, interfere with each other, and therefore you just let them do whatever they want, and then when they actually go to commit, that's when you actually go and figure out whether there's any, there was any conflicts. So as far as I can tell, and this is not, these, you know, these categories aren't something I came up with. As far as I can tell, at least in, in the academic literature, these are the only two classes of, of concurrent pr protocols you can have, optimistic and pessimistic. If anybody tells you there's another one or they have some protocol that doesn't fit these two, they probably don't know what they're talking about. Right? I've had people come up to me and like, I have this protocol. It's not pessimistic. It's not optimistic. And I'm like, it's wrong. It, it's, it's one of these, right? And this, is, this, this theory goes back until like the 19, early 1980s when, when they really started figuring out these different types of concurrent protocols. So it's sort of as a, as a preview, or, or we're going to talk about in the next couple of lectures, two-phase locking is an example of a pessimistic protocol. And then timestamp ordering is a optimistic protocol. So we'll have separate lectures for each of these two classes. But for now, we don't care about this. Right? We just know that we can have these mechanisms to ensure all the things that we'll talk about how to, in the upcoming slides, how to ensure uh, isolation. So let's, let's look at some examples of where, where some problems can arise. And then this will help us understand how these concurrent protocols can, can prevent us from having these problems. So let's say we, do, uh, we have two transactions in our system. And it's a simple, simple banking application. And we, the first application wants to transfer $100 out of B's account and put it into A's account. And then the second transaction wants to credit both of the accounts with 6% interest. Right? And so transaction T1 takes 100 bucks out of, 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 of B and puts it into A. And then the other one computes 6% you know, uh, interest on both. And assume that both of these transactions, or both of these accounts, A and B, have $1,000 to start with. So the question is now, what are the legal outcomes of our database of interleaving these operations of T1 and T2 in our database in, in arbitrary ways? Well, there's actually many, many possible outcomes. But the key thing to point out, though, is that at the end of the day, we always want A plus B to equal this value here. Because right, there always should be a thousand dollars in our, or sorry, two thousand dollars in our system, right? And at the end, when we compute interest on these, it should always add up uh, to, to this amount here, right? Now, the issue we're going to have to deal with in, in our system is that there's no guarantee that the 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 database system is going to 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 run these exactly one after another, right? Assume that in our application, our transactions submit submit are submitted at exactly the same time. Uh, and the data system can then decide how to interleave them in any possible way, right? But we want the end effect of our database. We want the state of the database to be as, as if the transaction is executed in serial order. Because that's going to guarantee that we, we don't lose money. We always end up with this account here, right? So at the end, our only two possible legal outcomes, and I'll define what legal means in a, in, in a second, are either A equals B equals this or A and B equals that. In either case, when you add these two together, you end up with 2120, which is what you would get if you execute these transactions in serial order. Right? So now where things get tricky is that now when we want to start interleaving these things, uh, we want to make sure that we end up with, with that state like that. So another way to look at it is sort of these transaction schedules like this. And the way to sort of read this is that the, going from the top to the bottom, we're, we're going elapsed in time. Right? And assume that we have a single thread and, and, a, and a single socket, and our database system can only execute one operation at a time. Right? So in the first schedule here, we execute transaction one, we, we, we take the money or add money to, to A, subtract it from B. Transaction two, you then compute the interest. Or, so T1 goes first, followed by T2, or then the other one, T2 goes first, followed by T1. Right? And again, the key issue here is that at the bottom, even though the, the values of A and B are different, the, the, when you add the numbers together, they are, they are consistent. They're correct. They're, they're equivalent. Right? So, but now if you want to interleave these operations in different order, uh, 
we want to do this because we want to make sure that we maximize the parallelism in our system. Right? And as I gave the example before, it may be the case that one of, the, one of these transactions has to touch data that's on disk, and it'll get stalled. Uh, and we want to allow the other transaction to keep on running and still make forward progress. Right? And it's even worse if you have to go over the network to get data from another node, because you know, now you're dealing with the speed of light issues, and that's, that's much slower, because it's farther away. All right, so here's an example of a good interleaving. Right? So in the first case here, T1 starts. We add $100 to A, then we have a context switch, and then T2 starts running, and it computes the interest on A. Then we switch back over to T1, then we t take the $100 out, then we compute the interest on B. Right? And so the key thing to point out here is that in this modification for B, we always make sure we did it in the correct order. Right? So we did T1 modified A, and then T2 modified A, and then T1 modified B, and then T2 modified B. And then that ensures that the end state of the database is equivalent to one where we executed them in, in serial order. Right? So that's an example of, of a good interleaving. Here's a bad one. Right? We add $100 to A, then we compute the interest on, on A, then we compute the inter interest on B, and then we take the $100 out of, 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 of B. Right? In this case here, now our final state of the database, the values for A and B, are not equivalent to one where we executed them in serial order. So in this case here, the bank ended up losing six dollars. Yes. When you say the interleaving is good, it can map to any one of the possible consistent states. Yes. So his statement is, his question is, I'm saying this interleaving is good because the end state of the database is equivalent to one where it's equivalent to where we execute in serial order in any serial order. So that's that's a very important difference between you know concurrency maybe like in like multi-threaded programs, right? In this case here, either state is actually correct. Because if I submit these transactions at exactly the same time, it's up to the database system to decide whether one executes before the other. And either one is actually correct. If you cared about one transaction can only run after the other one, then from the database system's perspective, we would just say, well, if you really cared about that, execute T1 first, wait until it comes back, then execute T2. That's actually called external consistency. Uh, and as far as I know, the only database system that actually enforces that is, is Google Spanner. Uh, like, if you submit transaction T1 in, in wall clock time, like, you know, the, the wall right there, that, that clock right there, if I submit T1 first, and then maybe a few milliseconds I submit T2, they'll ensure that T1 executes followed by T2, and then you end up with the correct, the, the, the correct outcome of the database equivalent to that serial ordering. When we talk about serializability, which is the next couple of slides, the correctness means I don't care what serial order, as long as it's any, any one of them. OK? And this is, why, this, this is why transaction correctness is different than sort of programming correctness. OK. All right, so in this case here, the, the, in our example, we ended up losing $6 because the bank lost $6 because it computed interest on B and, gave, and credited their account. Uh, when, when they should have subtracted the $100 first. So at this point in the hit system, when this transaction ran, there was an additional $100 in the system that shouldn't have been there, and it computed interest on that, and it, it, you know, it made money out of magic that shouldn't have been there. Yes? So your statement is, if I, if I don't have a preference, I can submit T1 and immediately submit T2. Uh, well, we expect T1 so if you require T1 to execute before T2, under the, what we're talking about here is serializability. Under serializability, then you would have to wait to get the acknowledgement back from T1 before you submit T2. Because the data system can decide that, to interleave these things in any way and pick any of the possible serial orderings, right, that as the final outcome. Now, maybe, maybe the, like, you know, if it's a really short transaction, we, we're essentially talking about, you know, milliseconds here, right? So it's not like I'm saying wait an hour, you know, like, you know before you eat, wait an hour before you go swimming. It's not like that long, right? You just, you know, you just wait to get the acknowledgement back, then you can submit it. Um, there are notions of transaction priorities where you can say that like this thing should run before this one or give it more resources, or give it higher priority. 
that's outside the scope of this. For now, just the key thing I want you to understand is that I submit these exactly the same time, or maybe one little bit of that before the other, and in either case, the data system can decide to execute them in any way that it wants. If you truly cared, then you, you'd wait until T1 comes back and then submit T2. Okay? All right, let's look at another bad example here. Uh, actually, sorry, this is the same example we had before. And again, the, the, the key thing to point out here is that the database system doesn't actually see these, these changes, right? It doesn't see A equals A plus 100, you know, A, B equals B minus 100. It just sees these, these low level read and write operations. So the, the database system doesn't understand the semantics about what your application is trying to do. Right, because it doesn't understand sort of correctness. It just knows that you were asked to do certain things, and it, you know, in terms of low-level reads and writes, it just does them. Right, so we, when we're going to worry about correctness and, and ordering of things, we're not dealing with sort of things like this. We're dealing with things like this. Right. All right. So now the first, so the first question we have is sort of, we sort of have this intuition about. All right, well, yeah, you know, maybe the ordering of operations need to occur in, in the right direction. Uh, but we want to be able to now figure out, like, how do we actually, can, can we formally define what it means for a, a schedule to be correct and produce the answer that we're looking for? And so I sort of said some of these words before, but in our, in our world here, we're going to say that a schedule will be correct if it is equivalent, and I'll define what equivalent means, to some serial execution. And I've sort of talked about what serial execution is. Again, it's, it's when the transactions are executed in, in serial order, one after another. So again, so a serial schedule is just that. There's no interleaving of any operations or any actions from transactions running at the same time. And then we say two schedules will be equivalent if the end state of the database is exactly the same as one where, uh, even though the for one schedule the transactions are interleaved, uh, it produces a state of the database that's equivalent to one where the transactions were, were not interleaved, right? And again, it doesn't matter what the high-level operations are that you're doing in your transaction. It's just, you know, for object A or object B, are they, do they have the exact same value as from one schedule to, to another? And so now, what I've been des describing in terms of, of these, uh, these, these schedules of these arbitrary interleavings that are equivalent to these serial ordering or the serial schedules, these are referred to as serializable schedules. So a serializable schedule is one that's equivalent to some serial execution of the transactions that we want to execute. And again, it can be any serial ordering. It doesn't have to be one in particular. So now we can say that if our transaction preserves consistency, meaning if, it, if it's going to execute our, and, and put our database in a correct state, then we, we, we know that every serializable schedule will also preserve consistency because the end state of the database, again, will be equivalent to uh, one that was produced by a serial ordering of our transactions. So related to so what, he, what, he, what he asked in the back, again, it's sort of this less intuitive notion of correctness that you may be familiar with in other, other programming environments. Um, and the reason why database management systems are allowed to do this or why, why we want to do this is that because we don't always have to enforce to one exact serial ordering, we can choose any serial ordering of, 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 of our final database state. Uh, this is going to allow us to make better decisions and have more flexibility in how we choose to interleave our operations so that we can maximize performance and get better parallelism. So if you had to, so if you had to pick one serial ordering as your final output, then there's only so many ways you can interleave the operation to produce that state. But if I allow for any possible serial ordering, sorry, for, for, you know, if I can target any possible outcome based on a, any serial ordering, then I can choose way more number of uh, arbitrary interleavings. So another key thing that uh, this, is, this is sort of not obvious to here too is that the, this is not something that, um, how do I say this? It's, for now, we're going to assume that we have all our transactions that we want to execute in our schedule all at once, and we can understand the correctness of, of just reasoning within those transactions. But in, in reality, in a real system, you're not given all these transactions all at the same time. Right? Things are showing up and, and arriving at different times, and you may not know exactly 
what's going to come later, so you don't know how to exactly target a certain serial ordering. What we, this is just sort of saying that if assume I have a finite number of transactions I want to execute, how can I produce an interleaving that generates a serializable schedule? We'll talk about how to do dynamic stuff again when we talk about the current protocols in next class. All right, so now that we know that uh, uh, what it means for a, a, a schedule to be equivalent to a, to a serial ordering, and therefore it's a serializable schedule, now we're going to understand a bit more about, again, in terms of correctness, how can we identify that a schedule is serializable? How can we identify that it would, the state of the database that it will produce when I interleave my operations in this way will, will be equivalent to a, a serial ordering? So to do this, what we're going to do is we're now going to define uh, our correct, correctness in the base of term of conflicts. So we'll define a conflict as being one where uh, you have two transactions that are different, um, and they're going to do some operation on, on the same object where at least one of them are, is going to be a write to that object. Right? And so the three classes of, of conflicts are going to be rewrite conflicts, write read conflicts, and write write conflicts. Why no read read conflicts? Doesn't matter, right? Who cares, right? All right, so we'll go through each of these one by one and also describe what the, uh, sort of the, 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 the parlance or the, the, the vernacular way of describing what these conflicts are. So the first one is a read write conflicts. So these in the literature will be referred to as unrepeatable reads. And basically, this means that if I read something once and I go back and try to read it again, I get back a different value. So let's say again, I have two transactions here. Uh, the first one, T1, wants to start. It wants to read some, some object A, it gets back $10. Then transaction T2 starts, it reads on A, it gets $10. But then it writes back $19. Uh, so now when transaction T1 wants to read A again, it, get, it gets back 19, which is a different value than it had the first time. Right? So this is an unrepeatable read. You're not able to read the same value from the same object within the same transaction. And again, if we're trying to ensure isolation, this shouldn't happen because T1 is assuming that it's running by itself. So it shouldn't see any effects of, of, of T2, right? So this, this is a read-write conflict. In this case here, this would violate our, 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 our serializability guarantee that we want to ensure. Next is a write-read conflict. And again, this is, in the parlance, this would be called reading uncommitted data or also dirty reads. And the way to think about this is that you're reading data that was modified from another transaction uh, that, uh, that, that you shouldn't have because it hasn't committed yet. So T1 starts, it reads $10, then it writes back $12 to A, but now when T2, T2 starts, it reads A, it gets, back, it gets back $12, right? Which it shouldn't have because it shouldn't see the effects of T1 because T1 hasn't committed yet, right? It's sort of happening in the middle of it. So then it writes back $12, you know, $14, uh, and then now the issue is that my transaction aborts, T, you know, T1 gets aborted for whatever reason, so now the issue is that I've already committed T2, but it, it read data that was not committed, and then also assume that when, it, say, after it read that, there was an if clause that says, if value equals 12, then write 14. So it, it decided to make some action based on the data that it read, but it shouldn't have read that data because it was, mo it was, it was written by T1, and T1 didn't commit. Right? So now this case here, T, T1 aborts, and we have to go back and kill T2, but it already committed. We already told the application that it finished. So this is bad because now we're sort of leaking incorrect data to the outside world. Right? So th this is the conflict, and we, we don't want this to happen. And the last one is a write-write conflict, and this is where we have our, we're, writing over, uh, we're writing over uncommitted data. Right? So uh, say I write A in my first transaction, and it targets, uh, you know, puts ten dollars in, and then T two right overwrites it. Then they, then they write B add to Andy, and then uh, I write to Justin Bieber here. So now when I commit, A contains nineteen, but B contains, contains Bieber, right? And that that's a conflict because because that's not equivalent to any serial ordering, right? It should either be ten dollars Bieber or nineteen dollars Andy. It can't be any inter interleaving of the two. So now, based on these three types of conflicts, uh, now we can talk about in a bit more detail of what it means for something to be serializable. So strap yourselves in, because this, this, this can be a bit rough. Okay? So there's essentially two 
classes of serializability you can have. Uh, you can have what's called conflict serializability and what's called view serializability. So as sort of a spoiler, what I'll say is that any time a database system says that they do serializable transactions, they're supporting conflict serializable. And to the best of my knowledge, nobody actually does view serializable because you have to understand what the application actually wants to do in order to, to be able to do view, view, serializ view serializability. So the way to sort of think about this is that conflict serializable is more restrictive, but it's, it's, we can actually do this, we can actually implement this in, in our database system. View serializability will add, will allow for additional types of parallelism, but requires you to know what the application wants to do, so nobody can actually do this. So again, the way to, again, when someone says they do serializable transactions, they really mean conflict serializable. Okay, so the definition of conflict serializable means that we say two schedules will be conflict equivalent if they're going to involve the exact same operations or actions in the exact same transactions, and then all the pairs of conflicting transactions will always be ordered in the same way for the, for the two different schedules. And so now we can say that a, a, new, a schedule S will be conflict serializable if that it is conflict equivalent, meaning the ac conflicting actions are always ordered in the same direction as one from a, from a serial ordering. So the way to sort of think about this at a high level is that if you can take your, your schedule and you can start swapping the operations in a certain order to produce a serial schedule, and you can always swap them in the right direction, then it's always going to, then you know it's, it's conflict equivalent to a serial ordering. And again, that's probably also very vague. So let's go through an example and hopefully this will make sense. All right, so let's say I have our, our, our schedule here. I have transaction T1 and T2. It wants to do a read on A, write on A, read on B, write on B. So the, what we're going to end up, want to do is we want to take different conflicting operations and we want to be able to, to, to flip them uh, in, 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 sorry, so we take non-conflicting operations, meaning they're, they're doing writes on different objects or doing reads on different objects, and we're going to flip their ordering to try to move all the operations from one transaction to the top and all the transactions to one, one transaction to the bottom until we end up with a, a, a serial ordering. Right? So the read on B and the write on A, these are different operations, right? They're, 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 they're not conflicting because they're operating on different objects. So we can go ahead and swap their order. Same thing, read on A, read on B, we can swap, swap them in order. Same one, write on A, write on B, swap them. Write on B, write on B, read on A, we can swap them. And now we end up with a schedule that's equivalent to a serial schedule. So in this case here, the schedule that we started out with before we actually did the swapping is considered conflict equivalent to this serial schedule here. Yes? So this is, this is the way to determine whether a, a arbitrary schedule of interleaved operations is equivalent, conflict equivalent to a serial ordering. Right, I sort of did, I did a hand motion in the beginning, I'm like, oh, you can swap these things in, in this order, and that's how we know that, that, that it's, it'll be equivalent to a serial ordering. Now I'm giving you know, an exact protocol on actually how to do this, all right? So let's look at one where you can't do this, right? So here we have a, a interleaving, uh, read on A, write on A for both transactions, but I have this conflict between a read on A and a write on A, and I can't swap their order, so this is not conflict equivalent. So this ordering here is not conflict equivalent to a serial ordering, because I can't transform the schedule to one that's, that's like, like on the other side. Right? So, again, this is to provide you the intuition of why it means for somebody to be conflict equivalent to a serial ordering or not. But obviously, in a real system, this would actually be, you know, impossible to do because, as I said, it's not like you always know exactly what all the operations of the transaction wants to do at the exact moment you need to figure these things out. Right? So we sort of need another way to be able to, 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 to figure out whether a, uh, our, our schedule will be conflict equivalent to a serial ordering rather than just flipping around their operations. And the way we can do this is through dependency graphs. All right, so what's going to happen here is that we're going to have a node in a graph that represents for every, uh, every single transaction. And then we're going to have an edge from one node to another if there's an operation on the, 
uh, originating node, from, so if we want to have an edge from TI to TJ, if there's an operation uh, in TI that conflicts with another operation on, on, in TJ, and that operation in TI will appear earlier in our schedule than the one on, on, in action J. So sometimes also in the literature, this is called a precedence graph. Right, you're just trying to figure out what depend what operation from one transaction depends on another operation. Yes. His statement is this assumes you never branch in the transaction. Again, like how to say this? We're not. We're, we're in this case here. We're kind of doing this dynamically on the fly. You don't need to know exactly all the transactions you have ahead of time. Right. When we talk about two-phase locking and other those, those protocols, they handle all of that. They handle the dynamic environment. Yeah so, yeah, so I should say, in this, it's, um, I should I remember say what I said. In this, this is, where you, this is where you know what all the transactions you want to do ahead of time, and the universe of transactions you're trying to schedule is fixed. Two-phase locking will handle that then on the dynamic case. This is, again, providing you intuition or to understand what, when we say something's conflict serializable, what exactly that means. Okay? All right, so again, so what we're going to say is that a, 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 a schedule would be conflict serializable if we generate a dependency graph and there's no cycles in it, right? Because the cycles cause the problems where we can't swap the operations to put it into a, a serial ordering. So let's look at an example, walk through it. So this is the same one we had before, read on A, write on A, read on B, write on B. So we have here, we have the, read on, the write on A and read on A, right? So the write on A appears first before the read on A from T1 to T2. So we have an edge from T1 to T2 in our dependency graph, and we'll mark it with A to say what, the, what object they were modifying or they, they, were, they were, had a potential conflict on. Then we have the read on B, so the write on B in T2, and then the read on B in T1, and then we have a, 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 an ordering there. So now we know that we have a, a cycle, and that therefore this is not conflict serializable because we can't go back and do that, that swapping to put us back into the, the correct state or to, into a serial ordering, right? And then the, the way to sort of think about this, the dependency graph is identifying that there's an output of T1 that will depend on, uh, that, that is used in, in something that, that T2 will modify, and T2 will modify something that T1 will depend on. Because of that cycle, we have to make sure that we actually, actually we can't, we don't want to interleave our operations in, in, in an incorrect manner. So, this, so look, look at some other problems. So now we want to maybe do more, something more complicated. We want to add maybe uh, some arithmetic operation. So here we'll do is uh, we have a read on A and then a modification on A there. So we know we have an, uh, a dependency graph or the edge from T1 to T2. And then we have a write on A and a write on A. So we have another one there. Again, we have a cycle, so we know that this, this schedule here is not conflict serializable, right? Let's have a more complicated example. Let's have th three transactions now, right? So we have the write on B and read on B, so we have edge there. We have the read on A, the write on A and read on A, so we have edge there, and so forth. Keep going and going, right? In this case here, uh, actually, that's all of them, right? Because write on A, conflicts with the write, read on A, write on B, conflicts with read on B. And then T2 actually doesn't read A, so that doesn't conflict there, right? So in this case here, this is actually uh, equivalent to a serial ordering, right? Even though the, in this case the transactions are interleaved, I could have it just T2 followed by T1 followed by T3, and that will generate the correct state. Because in the end, I'll see that the, uh, the final state of B will be modified by T1, and then the final state of A will be modified by T3. So in this case here, even though T1 started before T2, in my serial ordering, T2 would actually finish first. And in this case here, everything is fine. So let's look at another one. So let's say now we want to do something more complicated. Let's say that uh, T2 will run, and then it's going to compute the sum of all the bank accounts, and it wants to print them out to the terminal. So echo is not obviously a command you can do in SQL or in your database system. It's just a speed way to show that, oh, you, you, could, you, could, you could return a value for this transaction to, to, to your application. So it's going to return back the, the sum of, of, of A and B. All right, so the first thing with that, we have a, uh, we have a conflict between write, write on A and write, read on A. So we have an edge there. Um, and then we have a conflict on read on B and write on B there. 
So we have a, a cycle and dependency graph. Um, so it's not complex serializable. But is there, there's actually a way to modify the transaction a little bit to run the exact same low-level operations in our database. It's going gonna, it's gonna to produce a different answer um, in terms of what the application actually wants, wants to generate. But it'll run, the, again, the, the same low-level read and write operations in the database and it'll actually the, with this exact schedule and it'll still produce a correct answer. So instead of actually computing the sum, what if I just check to see whether the bank account was negative or not? And if it, if it is, then, um, uh, sorry, as long, long as I have, you know, as long as it's not negative, then I'll add, uh, I'll add to a counter and then I print out the count. So it's basically counting up the number of accounts that aren't negative and adding one to a counter. So in this case here, this is, this is the exact same sort of read and write operations, uh, but I'm, I'm, I, I'll produce an answer that, that's, actually, that's actually still considered correct. So this is an example where I could have an interleaving like this that is, is, is not conflict serializable, but it still produces the correct answer. So this is what's called view serializability. Yes? How do you separate the automatic from the graph? This one here? Yeah, like, it's okay. yes of T2, D1, D3, right? So, like, if there is another node, say D4, like two other nodes, D4 and D5, yes. and both inherited from D3. Both inherited from D3? Uh, like, uh, D3, uh, like, there's, uh, you know, like, edges from D3 to D4 and D5. Yes. How do you derive the actual schedule from the graph then? Oh, so, so, so you're saying, if I have, if I have this, how do I take this and actually generate a schedule? We're not doing that. We're basically, we're given this schedule, right? This, this, like, this is the schedule we have. And we want to know whether it's conflict serializable or not, right? We're not generating schedules yet. That's what two-phase locking does. This is just saying, if I have a schedule, how do I know that it's actually correct? That's it. Yes? So again, that's what two-phase locking does, yes. But it, for, at purposes right now, we're just dealing with the case of I have a schedule, tell me whether it's conflict serializable or not. That's, that's the answer we're trying to solve. And I'm doing this to, to, to have you guys understand what it means for something to be conflict serializable so that when we talk about two-phase locking uh, and we talk about you know, different variants of it, we know, we, we'll know that it, it'll guarantee to be generate a serializable schedule because any schedule that it, it will generate won't have a, 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 a cycle in its dependency graph, right? And in actually some, in some versions of two-phase locking, they actually maintain a locked dependency graph, and they, they look for cycles, and then you know, you know you have a deadlock and you kill things, which is sort of different than this. Yes? You're saying this is, this is okay? This example, this, this, is, this is considered, uh, this is conflict serializable. So, 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 yeah, so, if, if, the way to think about, like, don't think about this as, like, at runtime. This is, like, like, here's ex everything it exactly did, right? All these transactions committed. Tell me whether I interleave them in a way that was actually complex serializable. Yeah. We're not, we're not worried about, like, a dynamic environment we'll talk about in two-phase locking. Okay. All right, so, what I'm, I'm going to press upon you on this one, again, is... There's, there's, there's a different way. If I don't care about exactly ensuring conflict serializability and I just care about like some high level semantics of our application that I can use to figure out whether something's actually correct or not, uh, is, what, is what view serializability is. So I, I'm not going to go through all these examples, but basically it just says that uh, if the end state of the, of the database is. How does this? If the end state of the database is is the same as it would have been with a serial ordering, regardless of what happens in between uh, while the transactions are running, then that then that's consider, considered okay. And again, that's very vague. So let's let's go let's do this example. All right. So here, after transactions, T1 wants to read on A, 
and then do a write on A. T2 just reads on A, and T3 reads on A. So these are actually called what are called blind writes for T2 and T3 because I didn't read A before I actually uh, before I actually modified it. I just said I'm just going to overwrite whatever's in there. I don't care what was there before, right? But in the case of T1, it actually reads it first. So here now we we, we know that we're going to have problems. We'll have a cycle because we have all these conflicts. One wants to read A, but then it wants to write A. Uh, and, and T2 wants to write on A, and then you know, it, it, T1 would overwrite it. But the key thing, though, is at the end of the, the schedule, the thing that, that actually remains in the end is that um, there's a, the, the, the final value of, of A is whatever T3 wrote to it. So who cares what T1 and T2 did to it, right? At the end of the day, it's just T3. It wins. The right of A is there, and that, that's all that matters. So this is actually considered view equivalent to a, a serial ordering like this. Right? Even though I interleaved T1 and T2 in a way that conflict serializability would not allow, T3 was the last, the last writer, and it wins. So that's OK, and that's equivalent to this serial ordering. Right? It's, it's just this last right here. So view serializability is going to allow for all schedules that are conflict serializable uh, in addition to these blind writes and some, some other corner cases. Right? Um, the tricky thing is, though, and the reason why no, no database system, as far as I know, actually can support this is because the the database system doesn't know that it was OK that you know, these three transactions got mungled up and that the last one just got, got written. Right? This is, actually depends on what the application wants. Right? So this will require you to do program analysis in the application code to be able to reason about what the transactions are actually trying to do uh, in terms of reads and writes to make a decision like, oh yeah, even though th this is not conflict serializable, I can still allow these interleavings because this blind write will always, always make sure that everything is always uh, put in the correct state. Right? So the other important thing, though, to point out, though, is that there, conflict serializable and view serializable are actually a bit restrictive. And there are schedules that would produce a serializable answer, or sorry, serializable result or schedule, uh, that the, the protocols we're going to use would actually not allow. So in some cases, in two-phase locking, as we talk about, there'll be examples where clearly say, oh, well, this is OK. I don't, actually, I don't have to abort this transaction. I can let the schedule go. But because of the rules that are in place by that protocol, it, it won't allow you actually to do them. And you'll have what's called a false abort. Or you'll abort a transaction that didn't actually need to be aborted. And again, this happens because the database system doesn't know what correctness actually truly means in terms of the application. It just knows these reads and writes and knows how to, how to keep them ordered correctly. Um, so it can't figure these things out. All right, again, so this is why most data systems will support conflict serializability, uh, because you actually can enforce these efficiently without requiring you to know anything about what the application is trying to do. And then there's some special cases where you can implement these in the application uh, or handle you with, as a business organization that are not done by the database, database system at all. So the example I, he gave before about you know, well, the Sox one is a bad example. I, I'm not sure what you're trying to buy. Uh, but like an airline ticket, airline tickets, airline companies always overbook planes, right? Because they know some percentage of the people aren't going to show up, and therefore you don't have a wasted seat, right? You can sell more than you know, sell more seats because you know one or two people aren't going to show up, and then you're always still running at full capacity. And in the cases where they get get it wrong. They either drag that poor guy off the plane bleeding, or they, or they offer you money right, to, to, to get on the next flight. Because they know, in the end, they do the math and say, well, in practice, this, you know, uh, in the end, we make out because you know, a, with almost, you know, a certain guarantee, a certain percentage of people aren't going to show up, and therefore we can always you know, overbook. So that's sort of what I mean by these special cases. There's cases where maybe you want to allow for additional concurrency, but that's being done at the application level, or at the organization level, and not within the database system. So to, to, to wrap this all up, the way to sort of think about the universe of, of schedules is that you have all possible schedules you could have for, for your transactions, right? any possible interleaving. And then a small subset of these are the serial orderings, 
where you execute transactions one after another. And then around that would be conflict serializable schedules, and around that would be view serializable schedules. So again, anything that's serial is, is by definition conflict serializable and view serializable. Anything that's conflict serializable is by definition view serializable, but not necessarily a serial ordering. And then when we talk about two-phase locking, there'll be some other sort of subcategories in here that you can have as well. All right, so to finish up real quickly, now we go back to that, that acid thing uh, of going through all the examples. For durability, we, we've covered a lot already when we talked about logging and shadow paging. Again, we'll have a whole lecture about this uh, in a couple weeks. But basically, again, any changes you make to the, to the database, you, you, know, you want to make sure that Everything will always be persisted, even after a crash or a restart, if you ever tell the application your transaction committed. Now, maybe the case that you submit your transaction, you say go ahead and commit, and then the database system crashes before you get your acknowledgement. In that case, your, your transaction didn't actually commit, or it may not have committed, because you never got back the, the acknowledgement. As soon as the data system tells, that, tells you your, your, your data is durable, your, your transaction is safe, then it has to guarantee that everything will always be there. And so we'll use logging or shadow paging to ensure this. And we'll talk about how to do that in up upcoming classes. All right, so again, ACID are these three properties, atomicity, consistency, and isolation. Isolation and atomicity are, the, are sort of the, the, the major things we'll talk about in concurrency control. Durability we'll talk about in logging recovery. And the consistency will be something we can talk about when we talk about distributed transactions. All right, so again, to finish up, the uh, concurrency control and recovery are probably the most important parts of the database system. This, this is... A clear example of why you want to use a database system for your application to store your data rather than trying to U-roll your own file format or whatever else. Um, and the other important thing is that everything we're talking about when we talk about concurrency control, for the most part, the data, this is all going to be automatic. Meaning when we start taking locks on things, for the most part, you're not going to tell the database system, lock this table, lock this record. right? You, the data system can all figure these things out for you. And this sort of frees you up from the application program to not worry about, you know, do I hold a lock on this? Do I hold a lock on that? But, you know, in, in different data systems allow you to do different things. Sometimes you can provide hints about locks and things like that. But we'll cover that next class. All right, so any questions about concurrency control? Yes? Uh, is there any way where we can make the DVMS realize what kind of operations are happening on the data? So the statement is, especially, is there any way for the, to let the data system know what kind of operations are happening on the database system? Like hints? So you can do views for your Uh There's probably some things you can do. Uh, but I would say it, it's probably really hard to do. And you ideally want an automatic way to do this. And that means you have to do program analysis and support any possible programming environment. And nobody does that. Right? Yeah, I would say in general it's hard. I mean, if you run everything as stored procedures, then you can maybe figure, infer some of these things. I, I think it's more than just, though, how do I say this? It's more than just like what operations the applications kind of perform. It also has to do with this term of correctness about what, what is an allowed thing for me to do, or allow, what, what am I allowed to see, or is an okay result for my transactions that only a human can define. And whether you can codify that through hints. I don't think anybody's tried that. Another question. Say it again. So his question is, any schedule that is view serializable is correct? What's your definition of correctness? Uh, yeah, so, yeah, so, yes, so the way it will generate a result that is equivalent to some serial ordering schedule. Yes, and that terms, yes, it, it, it would be correct, yes. Yeah, so what, when we talk about two phase locking, two phase locking will, will produce. Serializable schedules that are conflict serializable, not view serializable. Or we, it may generate a schedule that is equivalent to both view serializable and conflict serializable, but we can't guarantee that. It only guarantees conflict serializable. To his question earlier, so he asked whether you could have some sort of hints to make sure it's view serializable. Answer is yes, but then you have to go back 
so far in the, in the program and will define everything basically? Yes, correct. Yeah, so it, it's a, it would be a major software engineering undertaking that I, I, I think it would sort of be impractical. Right. All right. So I also say too, and I realize people are going to people are going to complain on Twitter or, or or YouTube about this. So serializability is the gold standard in database systems. It is what you want to achieve, ideally, in your application because if you don't have to worry about any inconsistencies. You don't you you don't have to worry about any transactions. You know that you're you're going to be executing transactions as if they were executed in serial order. What we'll talk about next class are actually different isolation levels that relax some of the, the conflict requirement or, or restrictions that we talked about before to get better performance. So people will complain, I'll, I'll preface this in the next class, the dirty secret is that most people don't run with serializable isolation or serializable transactions. Most data systems don't actually even support it. If you use Oracle, for example, you say you, in Oracle you say, I want a serializable isolation level because I want all the, the things we talked about here, you don't actually get it. You get something lower. So in practice, serializable is something important to understand, but this doesn't actually show up. Uh, it's not as widely used outside academia as people think it is. All right, so in the last 30 seconds, Project 3 is going out today. We released tonight. Um, what you're going to end up be building is two parts. There'll be a, uh, you build a lock manager that does two-phase locking. So you do strict two-phase locking and regular two-phase locking. And then you also go back and take your B plus tree that you implemented in, in, in the second project due tonight, and you're going to go back and add support for latch crabbing. Be able to take locks, or sorry, take latches as you go down to allow multiple threads to modify the index at the same time. Because the, the, the B plus tree you're building in this first assignment is only single threaded, right? There's no, there's no protection mechanisms. Uh, I will discuss more about this on, on next class if you, if you guys want me to. I will post the, 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 the project right up tonight. And again, please don't cheat on this. Please don't plagiarize. We're going to run it th through Moss on, on Outer Lab. And then next class is two phase locking and isolation levels. All right, sorry to be in a rush time. Is there any questions? Done. Awesome. Thank you, guys.